The McCormick Longmeadow Stone Company was founded in Holyoke, Mass. in 1868 by Mr. David McCormick. He ran the company until his death in 1911. In 1905, the name of the business was changed to David McCormick and Sons Stone Company. This is a photograph of David McCormick's son, John McCormick, known as J.D. The company was chartered in 1931 and by charter amendment in 1939 changed its corporate name to the McCormick Longmeadow Stone Company Incorporated. This photograph shows the stone finishing fabrication shop located in Holyoke at the corner of Appleton and Winter Streets. At this time, all the finished stonework was done here in Holyoke. The majority of finished stone was Indiana lime, limestone and brownstone purchased from the quarry in East Long Meadow. This photo is one of a series provided by Mrs. Eileen Chaporis, John McCormick's daughter. These photos have never been displayed. This first one shows a couple of 1920s trucks, one with the company's name on the side, and the company employees are setting a limestone cross on its base at a church or a cemetery. Here is one of the stone cutters at the shop working on an intricate floral pattern on a brownstone block. For this fine detail, he's using a very thin chisel. And here he is examining the finished product, which you can see is absolutely gorgeous. Here, the same stone cutter is working on another stone in which he has carved the insignia of the Masonic order. This is probably a clay model plaque to be carved later in brownstone. And they also carved and finished gravestones here at the plant. And you can see some of those in the background here. This is a finished stone ready to be installed on a building. It's a rather odd character, likely adorning a corner of an unknown structure. If anyone knows where that may be located, we'd be happy to get that information. Here's another carved plaque modeled in clay. They did a lot of work for Mount Holyoke College, so it may be located somewhere on the campus. In 1932, David McCormick bought the old Taylor and Kibbe quarries. Also included was the plant and machinery on Crane Avenue from the old John Rankin Company, owned prior to that by James and Mara, down by where Home Lumber was located, which is now gone from that area. In 1938, they moved from Holyoke to East Long Meadow. This is a picture of Mr. Stratty Chaporis, who married John McCormick's daughter, Eileen, in the 1950s, and Stratty joined the company in 1954. He learned the business of quarrying and all phases of operating by actually doing all the different jobs. In 1960, he purchased the company from his father-in-law, John, who remained active in the company until his death in 1968. During the late 1940s and early 1950s, this was the only active brownstone quarry in the United States. We're backing up a couple of years now. We're at McCormick's Quarry on Summers Road, where the pond around Brownstone Gardens is now located. The quarry used to be called the Taylor Quarry and the Worcester Quarry when the Norcross brothers owned it. This is a 1950s photo of a section of overburden being loaded onto a waiting truck. Here is a 1959 photo showing the steel derrick at McCormick's Quarry. This was the only steel derrick ever used in East Long Meadow, 
All the others were made entirely of wood. We are focusing on only two quarries in this presentation. In my opinion, this first quarry, located on Summers Road, is the first and oldest one used in town by people other than the Indians, who use the stones for mortars, for grinding corn, acorns, etc. The Elijah Burt House on Chestnut Street, built in 1740, used stone from this quarry for the large lentil above the fireplace. Elijah was a stone cutter in town also. This photo is from April 1962 and the guys look like they're just about ready to start the season. There's a huge amount of overburden on top to go through before getting to some usable stone. The workers are a good 30 feet below the top layer. Notice the variety of different deposits on top of the quality stone, which all had to be manually removed. Here is a worker standing atop a huge pile of quarried brownstone at the Summers Road Quarry. They did a tour for folks to go through in the 1960s, so that's the people you see at the bottom of the photo. This is a 1960s photo of the Summers Road Quarry, and as you can see, the lower portion of the quarry is flooded. They must have been done using stone from that particular area, and it just filled up in no time. Here is the upper portion of the same quarry hole, still being quarried. You can see some tools on the landing there. They had to pump the water 24 hours a day to keep the quarry dry. But up on this upper ledge, they were able to still keep working. This photo shows a wooden derrick mounted on a stone pier with a truck bed mounted on the boom. The stationary part of the derrick is the mast. You can see the steel derrick from the earlier photo in the background on the right side. This photo is from the winter of 1963, taken by Frank Lacey, a police officer in town, as well as the town photographer. The workmen kept busy during the winter, moving quarried stone down to the plant on Crane Avenue. Here you can see one on the truck, loaded up and getting ready to head off to the market. In this photo, you'll see a nice pile of quarried stone all stacked up in front of the derrick and ready to be moved down to the stone yard. Next are two photos taken on the same day in the early 1960s. The first shows the open pit quarrying operation and you can see the huge pile of removed overburden in the front and the rock cuttings in the background. The second photo here shows the gang saw used for slicing rock into smaller slabs. This was all done here in the quarry, and then they could bring the smaller stones down to the finishing shed operating down on Crane Avenue at this point in time. Here are some workers atop a beautiful bed of stone. They're trying to crack the blocks vertically, and you can see a vertical crack in front of Mr. LaRocca in the white shirt on the edge. The stone has already been cracked with that machinery they have in their hands. The old truck bed is on the landing, waiting to be used, which will be shown in another photo. In the truck bed, suspended in the air by the huge lifting crane, is Foreman Coley Brown, who's driving steel wedges in a series to split the rock horizontally while Arthur Butler and Michael Sears observe. They're also called pins and feathers, and the pins are systematically hit with a sledgehammer until the rock has got a crack in it. This photo shows a father and son team on top. Luigi LaRocca is on the right, and his son Antonio is on the left. The three men from the prior picture 
are shown trying to remove the fractured stone from its solid bed. The crane will pick up the stone and put it on top where the other stone already is. Now we'll be moving on to the newest quarry to be open in town. New York University needed redstone for an extensive development project, so Mr. Chaporis bought the old redstone quarry off Elm Street in the early 1960s. Here in the photograph you see a dynamite blast going off to remove the 20 feet of overburden on top of the good stone. Ray Wright Excavating Company did this work. This photo was taken near the diving board of the old quarry by Keith Lindner. The new quarry is located about 100 yards away from the old quarry. This is the drained out bed of the old redstone quarry which was drained in order to show which direction the stone was going. Piles of red colored overburden from the start of the new quarry are seen in the right upper corner. This photo shows the workers getting the road bed ready for the new quarry. Mr. Chaporis bought the 30 acres from the Lindner family and got the land rezoned for a quarry district. Borings confirmed that over 14 million cubic feet of redstone lay under the ground here, so they were really excited to get going on this new quarry in town. And these are the first blocks of stone being removed from the quarry on July 29th, 1965. They were to be used at New York University in New York City. You can see the crane loading the stone. This photo is from the late 1960s and you can see the beautiful deposit of redstone that they're quarrying. Bob Anwood is in the right corner operating the rock drill. The lifting crane below is positioning rocks that have already been removed. This photo shows the old McCormick Longmeadow Stone Company building on Crane Avenue. You can see blocks of Indiana limestone and brownstone which are stacked in front ready to be shipped. And here is the new plant for the Stone Company which was built in 1961. Now it is the home of Pioneer Gymnastics. All the equipment has been removed and the interior retrofitted to make a nice new building out of it. The office was at 41 Maple Street, which is now Sonny's Mart. And this is a photo out in the stone yard showing finished blocks of brownstone on pallets waiting to be shipped. We're inside the rock processing plant at Crane Avenue, and here you can see on the right Foreman Omar Brault, and on the left, Mike Chagru. Here's another photo inside the plant showing the workers putting the tongs on the side of a rock that's going to be hoisted up. These are the exact type of tongs used to lift the stone from the old quarries in the 1800s. You would just take a pickaxe and make little holes on the sides of the rock. If you go up to the quarries, you can see the holes on the sides, and now you know how they got there and why they're there. This is a rock planer here at the shop being run by Paul Keeping. A gentleman was killed in one of these machines in 1970. I think he had his shirt untucked and got dragged into the machine a really gruesome accident at the time. This is an Indian worker from Canada who's running a wire saw. Water was used as a lubricant and to cool the blade. You can see the water coming out the bottom of the stone. They could cut the stone to any thickness they wanted to. These two gentlemen are running the massive stone breaking machine. It's William Miller on the left and Luigi LaRocca on the right. This machine puts a split face on the stone, an example of which you'll see in a later photo. There are two photos in a row here of the saws used at the plant. 
They are water-cooled, diamond-tipped circular saws, which were used to cut stone to various widths and lengths. The first photo shows the saw turned off, and the next photo shows it in operation. You can see the water coming out of the blade to keep the dust down and cool everything down. This is a photo from a newspaper article that features the workers at the Redstone Quarry on Elm Street. They are Scabblers, Rocco Rosa on the left, and Jim Gwinnell on the right, cleaning up the rocks of debris from the quarried stone. When they came out of the ground, they had a lot of debris on them, so they chipped away as much of the excess stuff on them as they could to get them ready to go down to the stone yard. You can also see that the rocks here are all numbered. This was done so they could be cataloged by size, width, and length. So for future use by the architects, they could just go pick that stone out of the pile that was outside and use it as they needed it. This photo is pretty self-explanatory. It's mill foreman John Bailey checking the rock. Beautiful piles here outside the plant. And here is a photo from July 1967, and the gentleman here is trimming the stone with a water-cooled saw to the architect's exact specifications. It was pretty high-tech stuff at the time, and it needed to be. The next photo shows the quarried redstone ready to be loaded onto a truck and taken to the plant on Maple Street. A lot of times they used old tank carriers to get the stone down there. It was pretty cool watching them come down Elm Street through the center. This photo shows the four textures of stone offered for sale at the McCormick plant. They would show these to the architects and they could pick what style finish they wanted for their rocks. The first one is called Crandling. The second one is Shot Sawn. The third one is Tool Finished. And the fourth is the Split Face. Pictured here, left to right, are Shop Superintendent John Bailey, Leo Giancola in the middle, who was a master stone cutter and carver, and owner Stratty Chaporis on the right. They're looking at a plaster cast model that will be later carved in brownstone for the facade at the insurance company of the North America building on Maple Street in Springfield. This is a beautiful photo from one of their brochures. It shows the nearly completed 22-story biology tower at Yale University which used over 7,000 tons of Crandall brownstone, a magnificent building. This photo shows the new South Wing at Trinity Church on Wall Street in New York. It's made with McCormick Longmeadow stone taken from the quarry on Summers Road. There's over 6,000 hours of carving that went into this building, and the architects were Adams and Woodbridge. The first photo shows the addition when it was newly completed in 1965. This next photo shows what the stone looks like in 2011 after being weathered out in the harsh climate of New York City. It's beautiful looking, but it's aged somewhat. This photo shows the Foss Hill Dormitory Building at Wesleyan University made of brownstone and the second one here is Wright Hall at Smith's College that's got redstone in it. And the third photo shows the Klein Chemistry Lab at Yale University made of brownstone. The fourth photo shows the Klein Geology Lab also at Yale University. Beautiful structures made with East Long Meadow stone. Here is a photo showing the pediment of the Insurance Company of North America building on Maple Street in Springfield, now the Milton Bradley School. It was done in 1965, and the eagle at the center measures 5 feet by 7 feet 
and took over 200 hours to carve it. This carving was all done with power tools, whereas years ago it was all done by hand. The second photo shows the facade of the building, which took another 1,500 hours to carve. These four columns in the front are all beautiful brownstone. It's a magnificent building. Here is a photo of Mount Holyoke College. They used tons of brownstone from the McCormick Stone Company. This is a close-up of the Skinner Memorial Chapel. The McCormick Company provided brownstone for the exterior as well as limestone for the interior of this building. Another fantastic building that they did. What is this odd looking building here? It's a 30 foot by 40 foot wall sent piece by piece to New York to be viewed by architects planning the library at New York University. The wall has sample panels of redstone and you can see some panels of brownstone in the upper right area. I don't know what became of this huge wall. I think it was dismantled and hopefully used somewhere else. But this is pretty much the scale model for the Bob's Library planned for the university. And this photo shows the completed building, the 12-story Elmer Bobst Library and Study Center at New York University, just off Washington Square Park. They use nearly 100,000 cubic feet of redstone, which is equal to 6,700 tons of stone. And it's all crandled, as you can see in this photo taken in 2012. This was one of the final projects for the McCormick Company. Here is a photo of the 240-acre brownstone quarry in Medina, New York, which was leased by Mr. Chaporis. The stone from this quarry was used on the trim at People's Bank at Four Corners, which was built in 2004. It's very similar to East Long Meadowstone, but our quarries were shut down at this time, and he was able to provide similar stone for this bank at Four Corners which we're very thankful that he used there. These are some photos of some of the local buildings McCormick's company provided stone for here in East Long Meadow. The first one is St. Michael's Church on Maple Street, built by Quinn Construction Company. It was completed in 1971, and it was the last building in East Long Meadow to use the redstone. This is a photo of the old public library in East Long Meadow before it was torn down. The brownstone was supplied by McCormick Long Meadow Stone Company, and just prior to it being torn down, Mr. Chaporis' son, Jay, salvaged some of the stone, some of which he sold to Yale University for repairs, and some of which was used in the construction of the new library mostly for the sidewalk. It's a shame they had to tear it down, but that's progress. This was the new Third National Bank on Shaker Road, made from brownstone. It's now Berkshire Bank, and the stone is nice and light in this photo in the 1970s. If you look at it now, it's weathered quite a bit, even in our town. And some people aren't enamored with the brownstone inside the bank. And the new people that bought it wallpapered over it. So you've got beautiful walls inside of solid brownstone that have a coat of wallpaper on them. More progress. This is another building in town which used brownstone and redstone supplied by the McCormick Long Meadow Stone Company. At the time the photo was taken, it was the R.E. Phelan Company. It became Carlin Combustion for several years and is now vacant. Hopefully someone can renovate the building and keep the wonderful front. 
And this is a 1976 photo of a large piece of redstone being carved by Christian Payne, who was a stone cutter who worked for the company. Brownstone Gardens is on Pleasant Street, built on large piles of overburden from the old Taylor Quarry on that site. Mr. Chaporis needed some stone carvers, so he went to Canada because we didn't have any local ones, and he hired Christian Payne, Ray Menard, and Mr. Mouton, who all came down from Canada and worked until the quarry closed down. This is a beautiful town seal in the center of town, commemorating the 75th anniversary of East Long Meadow. It was a gift from the Chaporis family, made entirely of redstone, from the quarry on Elm Street, and it was also carved by Christian Payne. The next photo is of another beautiful gift to the town from the Chaporis family to celebrate the town's 100th anniversary since splitting from Long Meadow in 1894. This stone is from the Summers Road Quarry, a light brown with a little bit of black put in on the lettering. In the background, you can see a third variety of stone on the town hall, which is from the Kibbe Quarry. The town hall was built in 1882, and the stone looks as terrific now as it did when it was first built. The Norcross brothers offered three shades of stone when they were operating in town in the 1800s. They offered the Kibbe, the Worcester, and the Redstone from Maynard Quarry. At the time, the same three shades you just saw here. In 1971, operations ceased at both quarries because of environmental problems. This is the quarry on Summers Road. The town made this a dump for a while, but it was shut down by the state and it quickly filled with water, as you can see in this photo here. Brownstone Gardens now adorns its banks. Here's another photo by Frank Lacey taken in the early 1970s looking north toward Pleasant Street. You can see a big pile of overburden in the background. The power plant is on the left side so you can get your bearings just down behind the town yard in the background. If you went to the same spot, you'd see brownstone garden buildings there now. Now we're up behind Graziano Gardens on Elm Street. This is redstone quarry number two, now filled with water. This photo is from 1974 after operations ceased and it filled with water and became a nice little lake in its own right. And this is the last photo. It's the old Redstone Lake now filled with water. Until recently, it was again owned by the Lindner family. In 2018, it was purchased for development by Al Joyce. And as we record this program, a subdivision of 20 or more new houses have been approved, and many of the trees on the property have already been removed. I wish we had bought this for community preservation, but that's progress. When these last two quarries closed, the quarry industry officially ended in East Long Meadow. There are still large deposits of redstone left under the water. Perhaps someday they will be unearthed and used again to adorn buildings in the future. This is Bruce Moore. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye for now.